Kia ora koutou. Um, ko mangatiri te maunga, ko rakahiri te awa, ko kai tuahiri te, te hapu, uh, ko uh, kati mamoi kai tahu uh, waitaha nga iwi, uh, ko midi ana puaha rawa, ko John Joseph Fluti oku tūpuna, uh, ko Paul Morgan toko ingoa, nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā rā tātou katoa. Um, first of all, um, yeah, I'm, I'm really pleased that uh, Pahia um, is, you know, aspiring to be like me and be no tahu, but, uh, you know, <laughs> it's, it's only a privileged few that get that responsibility. So, um, first of all, thank you to, uh, to, to Wai Māori and organising this uh, awesome um, hui and uh, giving me the privilege to, to be here today to speak to you all. Um, I've really enjoyed uh, all of the speaking. Uh, the kai, uh, kai or so far, and uh, you know the awesome mahi that's going on across uh, New, New Zealand in regard to uh, raising the, you know the the health and also the mana of our of our of our wai um, and our freshwater fish, and hopefully you know that's all part of raising the mana of uh, of, of Maori. Um, I've also enjoyed uh, the opportunity to to call it all with a number of you during breaks and uh, other sessions. So th uh, thank you very much for your uh, time and efforts and thoughts in this space. Um, so yeah, I've got uh, I'm a civil engineer with over uh, 25 years experience in in this area. I was actually a school teacher before I was an engineer, so I didn't become an engineer until I was in my 30s. So um, anybody that's good at maths probably can work out that 30 plus 25 plus a bit more means I'm yeah, pretty close to 60. Um, so you might have worked that out. You might have thought, well, with that grey gray hair, you probably are 60. But uh, the grey hair is not because I'm 60. It's because I've got teenagers. So, um, <laughs> and, and, and the other thing is that we've learned over the last uh, couple of days that uh, Pahi has shown us that um, you know, because he's closer to Rangatahi than Matua, um, but yet he's getting grey hair. So that you know, grey hair doesn't relate to age, obviously. So, <laughs> uh, so I, um, the the work I do in this space, um, you know, is um, you know I bring to it my engineering skills, but I also actually have a lot of uh, expertise in uh, our freshwater fish, and particularly my, my expertise is around how they behave around stru structures, um, you know, the unfortunate structures that we've got all through our hour. And, um, and I also am bringing, which is still a real uh, process of education and learning for me, is, is the te, te ao Māori aspect, so trying to bring Mataranga Māori uh, into the space of the work that I'm involved with. I've really enjoyed being at this hui because um, being surrounded by people who are actually really passionate like myself, around particularly the protection of our freshwater fish is not a, is not something I'm usually experiencing. I I work in spaces where uh, people see the projects that we're working on as engineering issues. Uh, for me, all I see is the fish. Um, so I'm a bit strange in that space, and I you know um, I often get referred to as the fish guy. So they say, oh, if they're having a problem at at a, at a place here. Oh, let's get the fish guy in to help us out. Um, but they only get me to help help them if it's the really difficult and impossible uh, problems. If it's the easy ones, they do it themselves and take all the, the credit. So um, it's it's great to be amongst people who are kind of working in that same space. So um, so I'm going to talk about uh, fish screens and fish passage mainly, um, and just a tiny little bit about um, species barriers. Um, the, so starting with really the unfortunately my talk's going to be very similar to the to the, uh, to the lake one yesterday um, about the bad news story, unfortunately, uh, the equivalent with our hour that was spoken about with the, with the, uh, with the, the role talk. So um, as a lot of you know, our, you know, we've got, you know, over th it's three quarters of our native species are either threatened or at risk of becoming threatened at the moment. And worse than that, you know, more than half of them are still in a state of decline. And the reasons a lot of them have been talked about by other people around water quality, habitat loss, the way we control the use of water, uh, introduce species fishing, and then structures. And it's the structures in the hour, which is really what my area of work's about and what I focus on. So, you know, what, what, what's the problem with the structures in the hour? Well, a lot of it's obvious. It pre prevents movement of fish, and our fish uh, migrate, and they need to move um, relating to their life cycles. And... Our, you know, having structures can result in loss of um, the abundance we've got of fish in places and where we've got places we take water out 
Um, unfortunately, we take out a lot of the fish as well where we're not screening them. And, um, and then there's also the, um, the very large impacts from hydropower on fish that actually go through uh, turbines. Um, I've got here <coughs> uh, the tuna. Um, for me, the, the work I do, um, the, the taonga species are really important in that, but, but the work I do really looks at every species of native fish. You know, to me, they're all important. Um, they're important be and, um, because to me, they're, they're there for a reason. And depending on what your spiritual base is, you know, you may have a decision about what that's based on in, in Te Ao Māori. You know, it's relating back to Papatunuku and Ranganui as to why every one of those species are there. So, you know, they're all important. And, uh, you know, I love the tuna, but I also, there's others, my favourites also, like the kuaro, uh one of the, the white bait species that, you know, I really enjoy uh, finding places and trying to, trying to help them uh, to, to become more abundant. So anyway, we know they all move through, uh, or a number of our species move through uh, the rivers and back to the moana um, at different stages in their, in their life cycle. So they really have a need to move up and down our rivers. That's really important. Um, so um, I think I've actually, have I jumped? No, I haven't, sorry. Um, yeah, I have. So in terms of fish passage and fish screening, the purpose of the, these, uh, in fish passage, it's really about finding ways to enable um, fish to actually get past those structures, whether they're wanting to move up or downstream. And then with fish screening, it's about where we take water out, which we're never going to put back. So things like for irrigation and water supply and industrial use, you know, we want to leave the fish in the river. So with fish passage, you know, what's the problem? A recent study by Niwa came up with these sorts of figures of the numbers of structures that are in our hour. I actually think they're very low. I think it's actually much more than this, but it sort of gives you a frightening number of structures. You know, when you look at over 4,000 dams, 700 weirs, um, you know, culverts and pipes, you know, 66,000, I think it's a lot more than that. Fords, tidal gates, we've also got pump stations and, uh, and also um, floodgates as well. You can check in there as well as a few other types of structures. So, um, so the problem's big, you know, NIWA's come up with 70,000. Even if that number's right, which I don't think it is, um, we know that um, generally, probably in the order of 25%, if you're lucky, of those structures will enable the right pa um, passage of fish, so three quarters of them won't. So we're talking at least over 50,000 structures that are a problem, creating a problem for fish passage um, in New Zealand. And, and, the, and what that actually means, and another way of thinking about it, Nevis kind of said that you know 48%, so half of the river network, so that's in terms of length, is at least partially, partially in, inaccessible to fish, and they haven't even assessed 36%. So the real number is something like three quarters of our whole river network has components that are actually uh, stopping fish to be able to actually get to. Um, so you know when you look at that, it's a big number. You start to take out some of our more pristine areas like Fiordland and stuff. The numbers actually it gets worse and worse really as to you know how much of a loss of the whole uh, our system that our fish you know aren't able to access. In 2018, uh, this uh, set of guidelines was put out about fish passage. Um, it's a really good guidelines. There was only a little bit of input from uh, from iwi, and one of the big things that's missing from this guideline is really um, stronger sort of thoughts around how to um, inc incorporate mataranga Māori. So I don't know what the plans are with that, but uh, a lot of us that work in this area are trying to bring it in, you know, in addition to the to the guidelines. Hopefully, what hopefully one day it gets added into them. Um, there's, there's a requirement for all regional councils to actually start assessing how big the problem is in terms of fish passage. And there's a website that's been set up through NIWA where it's basically, I've picked this area, it has uh, each one of those dots is a different type of structure. And if you click on them, go on the website, click on them, and it'll give you information about it. And it works out the risk of the risk to uh, fish passage and, and creates a priority. Um, all this information has been added by the likes of regional councils and DOC and uh, other groups, but pretty much anybody, even public, can go in if they know about a structure in their hour, they can actually go in, uh, read up about, okay, what information do we need to add? It's simple things like measuring if it's a weir, how wide it is, how high it is, taking some photos, etc. and you can upload it, and you can add to this uh, set of information, which is then 
hopefully going to be used more and more to actually work out, okay, where do we start in terms of fixing these problems. In terms of the solutions for fish uh, passage, there's lots of things like fish ladders and culverts, trap and transfer and where's... Um, uh, this, uh, this is actually from Australia, but we've, I've been involved in design of a similar structure in Taranaki. Um, so this is like a ladder system. Um, you've, you've seen other people have talked about simple solutions like ramps, etc., around culverts, which are not, not enabling uh, particularly upstream fish passage. And there's a couple of examples in there as well. So in terms of jumping into fish screening, sort of asking the same questions, you know, what, you know, why is it needed? Um, if we start with thinking about how much water we take out of our hour, um, which we never put back, so things for irrigation, water supply, industry, the, the number we take out is 15 billion cubic metres a year. So it's sort of hard to understand well, what does that mean. If we think about a volume, if we look at, a, say, Olympic-sized swimming pool, it's six and a half million of those every year that we remove from our hour. Um, even that's kind of hard to comprehend what it means. If we think about a flow, the amount of water we take out of our hour is 475 cubic metres a second. And what that's almost equivalent to is the Waikato and the Whanganui River, if you add those two together. That's how much water we take out of our hour every year that we don't put back. Um, which, when I kind of added that up, I've never seen that before, but it kind of was quite scary um, about how much water we, we take out. And where do we take it out? These are all the places, you know, across New Zealand, um, the the Brown dots are groundwater and blue is the surface water, so most of it's surface water. So it's, it's a lot of places. Um, and then when we start to think about hydropower, um, there's been quite a good study done recently we looked at, which looked at 90 different studies using that had been done all around the world using fish to look at their, the effect of, of them going through a hydropower scheme. And what they found on average was that 23% of fish are killed when they go through um, a turbine, but it varies between zero and 100%, depending on things like the size of the fish, the species, the type of turbine, and the, the head of water. So in some cases, in some species, it's saying all of them are killed. Um, in some, uh, you know, in, in some it may be a lot less. The reality is that every single site and every single power station will have a different number. So 23% is just an average. Um, and you know the fish are killed through the strike of hitting the, turb the turbines that hit them, or through the pressure changes um, in the barometric pressure um, as the, as they go down through these uh, uh, turbines. And that big number I talked about, how much water we take out of our hour, ten times that amount of water actually goes through hydropower schemes um, every year. And when we go to you know places like Waikato. You know, the, the fish, if they are going to journey down, you know, they've got multiple <laughs> chances to be killed, basically. And the reality is, is that when uh, hydropower um, companies turn up for consents, one of the common things they tell us is that, oh, most of the fish survive going through turbines. You know, and um, I think anybody that has the power to be involved in questioning that should really be asking the question, you know, where is your data for your site to prove that number? The reality is, um, for a lot of our New Zealand uh, hydropower schemes, schemes, it's going to be actually higher than 23%. Um, and with some species, it's going to be pretty much almost a, a, a definite uh, death, death, a little bit like what we saw yesterday with the pump stations. So in terms of fish screening, you know, how are we doing? The, the reality is almost you know, very few fish places that we take water out, we screen fish, and even the ones that we do have screens on them, almost none of them work. So uh, in Canterbury, where they have 1,400 surface water takes that require fish screens, they've done audits, there's quite a few hundred of them have got fish screens, the audits they've done show that less than 5% of them actually uh, work properly. So what we're really saying is that, you know, almost none of the existing fish screens bar a, ve a very small handful are actually doing the job they need to do of protecting our, our, our fish and keeping them um, in the hour and not but removing them. Um, and in regards to hydropower schemes, it's kind of worse because what I was talking about there, the 1400, they're all to do with the uh, irrigation, water supply, industry, industrial use. The hydropower schemes, um, almost none of them have any 
uh, allowance for, for the fish. A few small hydro schemes have core screens to keep the adult tuna uh, from going through the turbines. Because the reality is that very few of our hydro power schemes and adult tuna will survive going through. Um, and actually, just stepping back to that number, I said the 23% that they found in these studies, that's an instantaneous death. There's been other studies that have shown that there's a whole lot of fish that don't die straight away. They might die over the next weeks or months from the trauma from, from going through them. So the number's actually even worse than, than what I said. Um, in terms of guidelines for designing fish screens, um, in Canary there was a guideline that was developed in 2007, um, known as the NEWA guidelines, and then that's been updated um, just recently through this project, uh, which uh, Pahia talked about that I've been involved in, um, kind of rewritten a little bit. And part of this study, it was a four-year study, actually involved uh, some a whole lot of actual uh, trials with uh, our native fish, which had never been done before. Um, I'm just going to quickly show you a few examples. Um, so here's, here's a, a, a fish screen where the water's going through. The, the gaps in those, that screen, it's hard to tell by this picture, is actually only two millimetres, so it's a very fine screen. And um, here's a, a, the purpose of showing you these is they're all, they're all different you know, in terms of how they behave. So bluegill, that's a bluegill bully. If we move to uh, Canterbury Galaxid, you, you find that suddenly it's a bit more active in terms of once it gets going, in terms of actually looking for ways through a screen. So you see it swimming along and it's hunting for gaps. Um, and then you get to uh, this tuna, so this is like a uh, um, one that's sort of found about 10, 10 kilometres inland, and you find, you know, they're, they're really into it. You know, they're gonna, they, they spend their whole time trying to find a way through things, and they just yeah, go for it, you know, up and down. Uh, trying to find their way through, um, and that's that's a that's a, a short fin, a short fin tuna that's about 80, 80 millimeters long, uh, with two millimeter gaps. Another study that was done uh, was done for a different purpose, and I'm just going to show you this. This is with 1.5 mil gaps, so really even smaller. But this is with the glass alvas, um, and it I'll, I'll play it twice. So there it goes, boom, straight through. So. Um, so if I do it again, you'll see it uh, suddenly comes up and boom, it straight through. So yeah, tuna are um, amazing for getting through the smallest of gaps. So the gaps, you know, can be a lot smaller than they are. So they just squeeze their way through. Um, and um, so a lot of this work that's been done, looking at a whole lot of different species, has been really interesting to actually see the different behaviour of our fish around around these structures. So in terms of fish screens, what they look like, there's all sorts of different types. So uh, here's some, um, like in the top left, cylinder screen, um, and then the two bottom ones are flat, flat screens, and then on the top right is a cone. Um, other things have been tried, like rock buns, which are which on the bottom left, which are not very effective for our native species. They just like to move, uh, swim into them. Um, the right's a gallery being built where rocks then covered over uh, infiltration gallery, so it's a bit more effective than a than a, than a the rock barn, but still um, is you know, challenged by some. And then top top left is like a pump pump one. There's, there's lots more. They're just a few of the examples. I was involved in the uh, Rakitata um, diversion race um, project of designing fish screen. So this was so if you a lot of you won't know about it, but it's in Canterbury. It's the largest irrigation scheme in New Zealand. Um, and it was built during the Second World War. So they take like 35 cumex flow, so it's the biggest uh, single take of water. And uh, the, the Rakitata Diversion Race uh, Management Company, they basically uh, decided to design and build this structure. It's a bit hard to see the size of it. Each one of those cylinders is, is taller than a person. It's uh, 2.1 metres in diameter and about 8 metres long, each of those double cylinder systems. And they also have a... a, a a flat screen. A key thing about this is this to build this cost uh, 18 million dollars. So they spent 18 million dollars, and that's just to keep the fish um, in, in the Rakitata. So, you know, massive investment. Um, one of the few. So this is the flat screen, but and then this is uh, you know, as it's filled up. So the idea is the fish swim, um, the fish swim down through through here, and carry on down. And there's a system to get them back to the river and the water. Um, Oops. 
the, the water for the use comes through here through these very fine uh, screens and keeps the fish um, in, in the, uh, yeah, back, in, back into the river. Um, in terms of hydropower um, and adult eels, because that's a huge issue, particularly, you know, we really want to try and protect our, our uh, you know, the, the most important ones of our short fin uh, um, female, uh, sorry, long fin females. Um, so a number of uh, sites do things like they, they, they stop generation and spill more during periods of migration. Uh, they do that at Patea in, um, in Taranaki. Um, fresh friendly turbines are being developed overseas, but none have been implemented in New Zealand. Um, there's, other, there's other ways that they've tried to deal with the problem in a few cases, um, and they kind of help a little bit with, um, with adult uh, eel, but it, you know, tuna, but it doesn't really help the rest of the species. Um, and the final thing I'll just kind of talk about very briefly is I've been started to be involved in some projects in uh, Targo. We were actually doing the opposite. We were actually putting structures into the Awa, and the purpose of these is that <clears throat> upstream of these structures are uh, non-migratory galaxids and in Otago there's a whole lot of different species that are just found there. Um, they just live in the upper parts of the river. The problem is the trout, so trout get up and obviously devastate uh, these, these species. So these barriers are put in between the trout and the, the galaxids so the trout can't get up and, and the galaxids sort of live safely uh, upstream and they've been really effective and um, really in increasing the numbers um, of fish. So just to finish with a couple of lots of take-home messages. So with fish passage, you know the reality is the problem's massive, um, and it's always going to be the best way to fix this problem is to get rid of the structures that are the problem. But that's almost never happens. So the alternative is finding uh, mitigation. Uh, for me personally, anybody that owns a structure in an, an hour, they have an absolute obligation to meet that requirement, um, and because most structures are in the hour for a purpose, whether it's uh, water use, for whether it's hydro, whatever it is, <clears throat> somebody's getting a benefit from that, but you know, they pay back as they need to actually look after um, our fish better. And um, yeah, obviously in bringing in Mataranga Māori is gonna be <clears throat> an important part of finding good solutions. With fish screens, the, the message is the same sort of thing, really. The current state of fish screening in New Zealand is exceptionally poor. Um, as an engineer, it's almost embarrassing to see, you know, hundreds of fish screens that have been built over the years that just are completely useless. Um, you know, there's, you know, if we built houses like that, you know, where 95% of them are rubbish and didn't work, um, yeah, the people aren't going to be very happy. Um, <clears throat> so, and also, I think a, a big message for me is that you know, hydropower schemes have a massive impact on our fish, and it's kind of a hidden impact. You know, you don't see it. You don't see the damage it's doing, you don't see the fish it's killing, um, but it's happening, and it's happening in a massive uh, way. And you know, it's time for, I believe, hydropower companies to actually, you know, start to do some work to actually prove and assess what the what's going on, um, and and hopefully um, for mana whenua, you know, through particularly to mana or to why, you know, there's a stronger voice developing for 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 Maori to actually start to question a lot of these things. So, uh, thank you very much. Uh, Kia ora koutou.